thank you all who've, who've worked hard to bring us together to celebrate the life of this remarkable man. Uh, it's, uh, I was uh, talking with a friend, Phil Novak, this morning and talking about uh, deciding to do this. I've been kind of closeting myself away to write and Phil, Phil said, well, we just have some karmic debts. So my life was totally transformed by my experience with Jim. Uh, and it's been a quite a uh, wonderful experience over these last, uh, this last week as I went back through my notes and the articles I wrote about that experience to go back and, and just feel back into that remarkable almost two years I had in intensive work with him. And I tried to put my finger on the qualities of what made this man so effective. And I found it was a little hard to, to really get to the essence of what what enabled him to be so effective? Uh, it's, it's certainly there was a conti continuous deep self-awareness. So when you were talking with Jim, you had the sense of he was really present with you. But at the same time, he was also very sensitive to whatever was happening in himself. And it was a, so it was this open awareness encompassing both own his own reactions and feelings and, and sense of appropriateness in each moment plus this uh, remarkable sensitivity to, to your own experience. And then there was a deep reflection that went, al went along with that. It wasn't just that he was in touch with his experience, he really reflected very deeply on it. Uh, and of course he cared. There was a deep caring there, plus a, plus a remarkable authenticity. You know, the man wrote, who wrote The Search for Authenticity, it was a or partly autobiographical book. And it was really a sense in being with him, there was a sense of being with someone who was really, <coughs> there was no gap between his experience and his expression of it. It wasn't filtered, it wasn't, it wasn't prettied up in any way, it was just <coughs> an authentic expression. I knew Jim was, was good, he, he, Ray is right, he wasn't good enough to cure me, but he was good. Uh, and, but I, it really gave me a whole other perspective in 2012 when, I went back to Chicago to do one of the uh, videos that the American Psychological Association does of people doing various kinds of therapy. And uh, the person who creates that series is a man by the name of John Carlson. And John has probably, if you think about it, he's, got, he's got filmed dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of the best therapists in the country. So he's probably seen more really good therapists at work than anyone in human history. It's very interesting, because we don't usually get to look at each other working. That's an amazing profession. And we had a conversation before the filming, and he asked uh, who I'd been in therapy with, and I said, Jim Bugenthal, and he said, oh, Jim, he's the best therapist I ever saw. So, okay, that explains a lot. So. That that really that really does say something about about the Jim skill and the qualities he brought to, br brought to his work. As Ray said, he transformed my life. He transformed it not only in ways I might have expected, but ways I could never have expected and didn't even know were possible. And so the question, uh, one of the things I'd like to explore today is, you know, how. How did he do that? What was it that enabled him to be a master therapist? So I'd like to do two, three, uh, three things today. I'd like to present my experience of being in therapy with Jim and riff from that to some of the general principles that we can deduce about what made him so effective in the qualities of master therapists. Then I'd like to have a discussion and then I'd like to do an experiential exercise to bring Jim's presence into the room with us. And to do this, I'm going to have taken uh, a stance I've only done once before in my life to do a kind of autobiographical talk. So you, I beg your forgiveness, but that seems the best way to, way to give a sense of what it was like to work with this man. So first off, I need to give you the context, who, who it was who went into therapy and who went out, because they weren't the same person, I can tell you. Uh, but who went in was this young, Australian, MD, PhD, neuroscientist, hardcore materialist, no nonsense, so show me the research, does it work guy who 
figured uh, it, would, it would be a wonderful way to get to see Calif the United States and to get a three more years of free education to do a psychiatry residency training program at Stanford and then disappear back into my neuroscience lab. And so it was part of my residency training, uh, but you know, things changed. You know, California has a way of changing people. And I'll tell you just how retarded I was if I tell you that, you know, in the very early days of the residency program, we had our first psychotherapy seminar, and people were talking about getting in touch with feelings. <laughs> and my attitude was to get as far away from them as possible. <laughs> and, you know, and it was talking about this experiential transformation of feelings and helping people. It's like, I mean, I'm, I was thinking this was kind of insane. I mean, I realized I was in California, but still, this was a bit much. I mean, if a person has a problem, you figure out what it is, you show them what to do, you tell them to get on with it, and well, you know, that's, what's the problem? <laughs> but, uh, so I was doing psychotherapy, but I, I was also looking at the research, and I figured it wasn't terribly effective, and probably in my hands in those days it really wasn't. So, and that part may have been accurate. But I looked at the research, and the people who had the research were the behaviorists, so I became a hardcore behaviorist. And, kind of looked down my nose at everyone else and would have thought everyone in this room was ridiculous at that stage, but uh, since I'm now one of you. Uh, but I was doing this, so I figured I had this moral obligation to at least try a few weeks of it myself. So um, Jim Bugenthal and Irv Yalom were doing a psychotherapy session. There was a seminar for us, and there, there was something about this guy. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was something intriguing about this guy. So. I was tossing up between a hardcore psychoanalyst who all the other psychiatry residents were seeing, so to be part of the, that crowd, or to Jim. And I thank the heavens that I chose Jim and figured I'd go in for a few weeks and see what happened, then I'd go back about my life, except the problem was that by the time Jim had finished with me, there was none of my old life to go back to. Uh, I had, the therapy lasted 20 months. It was first twice a week, then end up four times a week. So it was pretty intensive uh, over that time. And uh, by the end of, end of those 20 months, I had a radically new view of the mind, myself, uh, human nature, potential pathology, who and what we can become of experience, of values, and of what we can, what we can know. And although I didn't grasp it at that time, I was well on the way to a radical transformation from a hardcore materialist scientismist to a kind of radical idealist, having almost done 180 degrees. So the question is, you know, I wasn't the only one, obviously. Uh, how many people were here were in therapy with Jim? Anyone? Others? Others? No. Okay. So. Uh, So what I realized as I was reflecting over this last week is I can't really do full justice to what Jim did and how he did it uh, because there were depths and skills that he had that I probably still don't grasp. It was so rich, so multi-layered, so subtle, uh, but I can certainly sketch some highlights. And perhaps the most recurrent experience of all was surprise. It was like one experience after another that I just wasn't expecting, that I didn't even know was possible, coming up. And, in, and this was not a surprise to Jim. And we did something interesting. 30 years after the therapy, we went back and did a dialogue about our work together. So it was probably the longest retrospective <laughs> on therapy <laughs> ever. And I said, well, this is one of the main things that happened. You know, it was so much so much surprise, and he, his response was, I said, you once commented that one of the things that marks effective therapy is the element of surprise. And he responded, a resounding yes. Surprise is one of the hallmarks of effective inner searching, because growth is so often a movement into the unknown. Yet it is often a paradoxical unknown, because a recurring statement of inner discovery is, I never knew that about myself before, but I've always known it. So the surprise can be both learning something new and realizing 
that the learn learning is actually a recognition, a recognition. And hopefully therapy will be an ongoing surprise for the therapist. So what was the main surprise? Well, for me it was discovering that there's an inner universe as vast and mysterious as the outer, and that I had spent my entire life entirely unaware of the profound inner experiential universe within us and available to us. And I said to Jim that it felt like, it feels like I've spent my entire life living on the top six inches of a wave on top of an ocean I didn't even know existed. And to which he responded, that was, that's a marvelous metaphor. But that's literally what it felt like. So how did this ha how, how did it happen? How could someone train you like to do that? Well, working with Jim felt like being hooked up to a human biofeedback machine. And the developmental process went something like this. At the beginning of the, early on the therapy, I would say something and he would respond, you know, Roger, when you said that, I noticed you pulled back in your chair and your voice went down and you kind of contracted a little bit and felt like you pulled back from me. And I, my response would be something like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and then after a couple of months, it's like, oh yeah, actually I did contract a bit, didn't I? Uh, okay, well, that's interesting. And then a couple of months after, it's like, y yeah, you know, you're right. I did, I'm aware now I feel this, this fear. And a couple of months after the, that, it would be, oh yeah, right, there's this feeling and, and there's this thoughts of being scared and being a little kid and it's, uh, Oh, yeah. And then after, I don't know, maybe about six or eight months, there was this mind-blowing recognition that along with the physical contraction and pulling back and this and that, there were these images which would arise which would exquisitely symbolize the state of mind I was experiencing what psychologists call auto-symbolic imagery. And that these were cues to what was going on below my conscious awareness. So uh, at that, that time I was not exactly well doing well with anger, so I mean, maybe an image would come up of me, me hitting Jim and I would clue, hmm, maybe I'm angry with you. <laughs> <laughs> A blinding, in, another blinding insight into the totally obvious, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the, I was, you know, I was, I was learning, <laughs> and I was learning because Jim would give this exquisitely subtle feedback. You know, you know, when you said that, your voice went down, and you put, turn, you put your eyes down, and I noticed you contracted your fists. It's like, yeah, all that happened. How, and, and there's an inner experience going along with that that creates it and mirrors it and reflects it. And then there became the recognition that along with the emotion arising, along with the auto-symbolic images, were somatic sensations. And that each emotional experience has its own somatic expression, its own localization in the body, its own particular feeling, texture, tone. and that there was this palette of information about the mi our mind state, what we want, what we fear, the motives, the, 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 the emotions. All this was available moment by moment in a continuous ongoing flux that was informative that, we could, that I could turn to for information about what's the most appropriate thing to do in a situation, or what's the best response in this moment, or what is the most helpful thing I can do for this person. My, that was available every moment if I just woke up enough and stopped enough and was turned attention in to be sensitive to that. And I named it a, the Rosetta Stone, and in a Rosetta Stone it was like having a new language available, a whole new array of information, a whole new additional bandwidth of, of data about, about what's skillful, what's appropriate, what's, what's to be learned in this moment. 
all of which had been entirely unsuspected before. And if, you know, I had been living up here somewhere out of touch with everything else going on. So, and this came because of this exquisite feedback from Jim. He, would, he could pick up so much information in a, in a tone of voice. You know, you, as you said that, towards the end of your sentence, your voice rose a little and it felt like you, like, okay, thank you. Yeah, I see what you mean. Um, and I have to say that for me, it's been a real uh, having, I, I, th I think he trained me in that to a certain extent. And now, for example, I am amazed at how much information is conveyed in a person's voice. Sometimes if I'm working with someone in therapy, for example, I'll just close my eyes and just hone in on the voice and all the little nuances of information that are being given out in each moment by, by someone. So uh, it felt the analogy that came to mind for me was, was like the, dis the discovery of the microscope. We, you know, a few, it was only four centuries ago that people developed the compound microscope and suddenly a whole new universe was unveiled. There was a mic people learned that there was a microscopic world of, of bacteria and, 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 and mi microscopic creatures of one kind or another, and this human body is composed of cells which are composed of nuclei and organelles, etc. All this suddenly became available when people developed the requisite sensory capacities for, see, for being able to see this. They became what the philosophers call adequate to the stimulus. And this, so the analogy here of the microscope, I think, holds for what Jim called the inward sense. This a capacity we all have to turn our attention inward and find this palette of information and feeling and guidance available to us moment by moment by moment. Um, but if we don't have this inward sense, then we're not awake to our inner universe. We're not what the philosophers call adequate to it. And the philosopher, uh, philosopher economist E.F. Schumacher wrote a wonderful little book in 1977 called A Guide for the Perplexed, which is about this adequatio, the capacity, the refining of our capacity for uh, being sensitive to deeper levels of information. And he has a beautiful quote. He said, if we do not have the requisite organ or instrument or fail to use it, we are not adequate to this particular part or facet of the world. As far as we are concerned, it doesn't exist. This is the great truth of adequatio. So Jim was a master of the inward sense. And I've come to appreciate that our capacity to be sensitive to another human being is, our, is a function of our capacity to be sensitive to our own experience. We can only resonate with, empathize with, pick up in others that which we are open to and capable of experiencing in ourselves. And Jim, with this exquisitely refined inward sense, which was honed by his authenticity, the uh, willingness to experience whatever came up, the defenselessness that was a part of that. And defenselessness, openness are, I think, key elements of the inward sense. To that extent, he was able to train me and others to similar levels of sensitivity and to open the inward sense, even for those of us who hadn't even known it existed. So you can imagine with this new capacity, this new openness to experience, there would be a lot of sequelae of that, and there were. Uh, the first was a, simply a sense of time dilation. It felt like my life had gotten three or four times as full, and the one day was like taking 
taking days or weeks because suddenly instead of just going through life paying very little attention to what was, go what was actually happening in my life, now I was paying a lot of attention to it and suddenly everything was so much richer and fuller and it just felt like, like a day was literally was what a, a week used to feel like. There was, one, I'll give one example of, a, of this kind of new level of sensitivity which will just give a sense of how refined it got. I found myself developing synesthesia. You know, synesthesia is cross-modality perception where you, uh, you hear a sound and you also see it and maybe smell it. And it's supposedly a very rare uh, sensory phenomenon in people. But what I found was when I paid it really close attention, it was there, if not in every minute, then it seemed like an awful lot of minutes. So I came to feel that synesthesia is actually something all of us have going on, but most of us don't tune in sensitively enough to be aware of it. And I was interested enough to follow up on a study. I figured, if well, if, if uh, that's true, then meditators who have been shown to have refined perception should, should display a lot of synesthesia, and it turned out they do. So I think that what has been formally be being thought of as a neurological fixed limit thing that only occurs in a small percentage of people is actually a capacity all of us probably have if we just pay attention closely enough. Uh, <coughs> of course, this empathy that Jim had also allows for uh, you know, the training he was able to do with those of us who were in therapy of developing the sensitivity also led to capacity for more empathy in others and uh, with others. And I've been astounded, for example, doing therapy that sometimes I'll be sitting in therapy and I'll just notice this, for example, pressure in my chest and a sense of tightness and anxiety. And I'll ask the, the person I'm working with, are you fear, by any chance feeling this? And I'm just surprised how often they will, they will say yes, and even to the local, localization of the somatic sensation. Uh, Needless to say, this gave me a very different view of therapy. I, well, I rapidly, <laughs> rapidly ended my career as a behaviorist, uh, <laughs> and I came to think that, that a lot of the therapy we do is very indirect and not terribly efficient. For example, um, uh, free association is a way of getting information. Well, who needs it when all you have to do is tune in and, and you know, with someone who's in touch with their experience moment by moment. It, you know, that one of the gifts of being with Jim was learning that if we just turn attention inward, if we just stay with our experience, what is necessary will arise into experience. So that led to a much more uh, trusting view of the mind, which I'll talk about in a little, little while. Um. This also led to a very new attitude towards my own mind. It basically went from being scared of my own mind to being excited by it. And I had gone into therapy uh, feeling that the inner world was filled with these subterranean monsters and so forth, uh, and ended up feeling that it was a source of information, wisdom, and direction. And I'll speak a little more about that late uh, afterwards. Um, now, of course, through all of this, you can hear the point about Jim's remarkable capacity for sensitivity to his own experience, sensitivity to another's experience, and for empathic resonation with another person's experience. He was a master of interpersonal skills. He was probably, I think of him as the opposite of uh, Harry Stack Sullivan. Sullivan, as you know, probably know, was the founder of interpersonal psychiatry, uh, a form of psychiatry therapy ba uh, ba and psychology based on, the, on emphasizing interpersonal relationships. There was just one problem. Sullivan was notoriously abysmal at interpersonal relationships. <laughs> And we, you know, we, we research is me-search, so. Uh, 
And Rollo Mays told me this story once, which <laughs> I have witnesses to this. this <laughs> so I'm not making this up. He says he, w he was uh, worked with Solomon at one stage, and he was in a, one day he was in a meeting with Solomon, which Solomon just pissed everyone off. And people basically stomped out of the room until the only person there with Solomon was Rollo May. And Solomon had his head in his hands, uh, and Rollo felt sorry for him, so he went up to him and said, uh, Dr. Solomon, are you okay? And Solomon said, oh God, I alienated everyone. To which Rollo responded, oh no, no, Dr. Solomon, you didn't alienate me. To which Solomon responded, oh, you don't count. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so, so, this change in attitude towards the mind, I think I can essentialize this by saying that the attitude that Jim helped transform in me was an attitude of viewing myself as a victim of the mind to viewing myself and, and mind as creator. And previously I had a very passive view of, for example, of emotions. Emotions were something that came over you and you kind of, you know, tried to get rid of them as fast as you possibly could or distracted yourself. But in therapy with Jim, I came to realize that emotions are something we actively create, and at some level, they are a they are a choice, not a conscious choice necessarily, but at some level, they're a choice. And the first insight I had into this was once it was in a therapy session where I was I was scared of doing something, and. I'd, by that stage, uh, partly as my behavioral training, I had wired up all these rela I had wired up relaxation responses and happiness responses. I mean, I was kind of a walking lab rat or a, or a salivating dog. I had these conditioned responses I'd wired up to use. And they, were, they, they were helpful. They played their part. So as I thought of you know, relaxing and releasing this anxiety, to my amazement, a second fear came up. But if you let go of that fear, you'll do it. And I saw immediately that the fear was at some level carefully chosen to prevent me from doing that which, I, that which was still scary to me. And, <clears throat> and a second kind of eureka moment came uh, when my family came to visit from Australia. And uh, I... Uh, by that stage, as I said, I had all these behavioral responses wired up. And my family came, and I immediately became kind of depressed, or bummed, <laughs> put, put it more technically. Uh, and, and for three days, I was Ugh. And then I, like, it took me three days to remember that I had all these behavioral responses I could use to let this go. And in the next minute, my whole view of the mind changed because I realized, I didn't want to use them. Right. Again, at some level, this was a con this dysphoric mind state was a conscious choice. And as Jim said, so much of our energy in life are wasted fighting inner demons which we ourselves have created. But because we're so alienated from ourselves, we fear and distrust our own nature and set up defenses which alienate us even further. We can't defeat our demons, but we can see through them with clear awareness. So with Jim, there was the learning to see through, or look at demons, and begin to see through them. And demons turned out to often take the, thought of the role of thoughts. And one of the things in working with Jim was uh, this continuously deepening recognition of the power of thoughts. That, and the recognition that unrecognized thoughts become unquestioned beliefs. And that beliefs 
operate as self-fulfilling prophecies. I've come to appreciate very deeply two quotes uh, from very different people, one the Buddha and one John Lilly. And John Lilly said, within the province of the mind, what I believe to be true is true or becomes true within limits to be found experientially and experimentally. These limits are further beliefs to be transcended. Within the province of the mind, there are no limits. And the other quote I love is from the Buddha. Now it's very interesting. If you were one of the brightest, smartest, and most awake people to ever land on this planet, what would you start your teaching with? Well, it's interesting that after he taught his Four Noble Truths, the, the f opening lines of the Dhammapada, the, probably the, the closest thing we have to the direct words of the Buddha, begin with the words, we are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts. With our thoughts we make our world. That's a pretty powerful statement. So with Jim's help, what I recognized was that, that the power of thoughts and, and beliefs and that I had so many unnecessary, pain-producing, destructive beliefs. Beliefs such as you deserve to suffer or you don't deserve that or if you Nobody will like you if you seem too happy or too powerful, all of which were self-fulfilling prophecies. And I've come very much to appreciate the words of that great American psychologist Henry Ford, who also made cars, who said, those who believe they can do something and those who believe they can't are both right. And one way in which these negative limiting beliefs create their, create their limitations is through what I think it was Maslow called the Jonah complex, the fear of our own potential and greatness. And what I realized in therapy with Jim as he kept feeding back, you know, you seem to be underestimating yourself. You seem to be, why do you think that you have to do that. Why do you think you can't do that? Yeah. With that constant feedback, I began to recognize the power of the Jonah complex in me. And that, the, that I had this belief that it was safer to be small and powerless. That way I wouldn't offend people. That way I wouldn't upset the apple cart. And so that I was constantly self-handicapping uh, with the myself in order to, to not create the problems that I thought would come with, with simply being authentic. Yet this of course creates its own suffering. Uh, it creates inauthenticity, it creates unrealized potentials, it creates metapathologies. And I love Maslow's quote, if you plan on deliberately being less than you're capable of being, then I warn you that you'll be deeply unhappy for the rest of your life. Powerful statement. Now, as all of us know, thoughts don't come one at a, by themselves. They come in whole floods. And one of the, one of the amazing discoveries of being in therapy with Jim is I began to get aware of thoughts was that we are immersed in a ceaseless flood of usually unrecognized or at least subliminal thoughts which create what I came to think of as a form of, of individual and collective self-hypnosis. Think of it. We have this continual train of thoughts going through our minds telling us about who we are and what we can do and what we can't do and what's appropriate and what we have to believe, etc. Like that, as far as I can see, is self-hypnosis. Of course, the contemplative traditions would agree completely. 
the whole one, of what, one way of looking at the contemplative traditions is their emphasis is on awakening from the trance created by our constant inner dialogue, or as AA call, calls it, the, the, the constant inner, inner, inner idiot monologue. Uh, uh, and as I made, a, after working with Jim, I got eventually into contemplative practices, which have been very important for me. And one thing that amazed me was how much of the contemplative practices were actually foreshadowed by the work with Jim. So much of meditation was about developing a sensitivity to one's inner experience, to opening to whatever experience arose, to the recognition of thoughts, to the becoming aware of them rather than getting lost into them, etc. All of these things that Jim was working with uh, in a, in if not with quite the sophistication of 2,000 years of contemplative tradition behind him, he had intuitively come to out of his own direct experience and out of working with pe people over decades. So, <coughs> so I came to recognize, begin to recognize in therapy that these, the this inner flood of thoughts all of us carry were self-hypnotizing and creating a kind of filter through which we experience the world. And when I got into contemplative practices, I found that, yes, this was a, a central theme of contemplative traditions, that we live in this, uh, what is they often refer to as an illusion or a dream created by our own self-hypnosis from which we are awakening. We, we, our task is to awaken. But the interesting question, of course, is how come we don't recognize this? How come we're not aware if we are self-hypnotizing moment by moment by moment and our culture is one of self-hypnosis, almost a collective psychosis, then, and by the way, once you get what we call normality is actually a form, of, a form of collective psychosis, an awful lot about the world begins to make a lot more sense, really. Um, and the, the contemplative traditions would say that our normal state is a form of collective psychosis. It is, a, it is a distorted mind state through which we view the world in a, in a fractured, fragmented, distorted way. And we all share in this. And that is a clue to one, a couple of the reasons we don't recognize this. One is because all illusions and delusions are self-masking. Second, because we all share of it, and third, because we all partake in the biggest cult of all, culture. And quite the contemplative traditions would say that's quite literal. So part of therapy with Jim was coming to the recognition of the power of thoughts and a beginning appreciation of the awesome power of this, this, this ever-flowing train of thoughts and then going into contemplative practices afterwards, began to give tastes of the pure awareness that is always available in each and every moment behind that flood of thoughts, which if you can bring the train of thoughts to stillness, then you get an immediate, in that second taste of pure awareness, and that pure awareness turns out to be our true nature. Uh, available in each and every moment, if we can dehypnotize ourselves, even so ever so briefly. And there's one uh, technique in the contemplative traditions, which gives an immediate taste of that pure awareness behind behind thoughts, that pure awareness which we are. And so I'd like to do that now. And in just a moment, I'm going to do something, and it'll be kind of a surprise. And in that moment. What, look, what you'll find is the thoughts will stop, and in that moment, there'll be just a moment of immediate clarity, extraordinary clarity, stillness, openness, a recognition of unbounded aw awareness like space. So if you just, <coughs> just for one moment, just be ready to to be aware of that, that which lies beyond the hypnotic flow.
flood of thoughts. Ah! Now, pure awareness, clarity, unbounded, knowing. There in each and every moment, behind all the experience. And the contemplative traditions would enable us to rest in that unidentified with and undisturbed by the flood of emotions and thoughts and images, etc., that usually we are so <coughs> hypnotized by. So, so Jim gave a, a taste of that hypnosis. And it's been interesting to see that he had, he was opening doors to something which is bottomless, as with so many of the things that he gave. So you can understand that as a result of this work, I was getting a very different view of the mind, very different. Certainly a lot different from the conditioning rats that I had thought I was going to spend my, my career uh, using as a metaphor for, for working with the mind. Um, and one of the nice things was that this led to a, a far more positive view of the mind and so much more self-acceptance. There was a, formerly I'd, I'd operated out of the belief that I couldn't trust my mind and hence myself. I had to be constantly on guard, constantly self-monitoring my experience to make sure I didn't screw up, didn't do that, the other, etc. And as Jim described it as, quotes, a master-slave relationship in which you have to constantly be watching and on guard against yourself. He said that a lot. Uh, and with time, I was able to recognize this lack of self-trust was actually very destructive. And uh, the constant self-judging just created a lot, a lot of pain. And I've come to love a line from the third Zen patriarch. The burdensome task of judging brings annoyance and weariness. And I certainly spent a lot of time being annoyed and weary. Uh, but the way out is, this is the coming to trust one's own mind, which Jim was an exquisite trainer in. And the third Zen patriarch says, concludes, the way is one with the trusting mind. <clears throat> so I came, to, I came to a far more positive view of the mind. And I came to think uh, the metaphor or image that makes sense of this for me is that what was, or to, the image to make sense of the conundrum of why we most people fear their own minds. And frankly, I think it's one of the greatest tragedies of human existence that most people live in fear of their own minds. There is this belief in our culture and uh, maybe, maybe global that within us are these horrible demons. If we turn attention inward, we'll find these yucky stuff. And the, and the metaphor that I have found very helpful is this, is, is turning on a faucet that's been closed for of several years. And when you finally get this rusty faucet open, what comes out is a lot of gunk. Mm -hmm. And the immediate response is, ooh, turn that off, yuck. But if you just let it flow for a while, what begins to happen is the water gets clearer and clearer until you're getting this pure crystalline <coughs> water coming out. I think that's a wonderful metaphor for what happens when we turn attention inward. What first we first become aware of are all the things we haven't been willing to experience. All the negativity, the pain, the trauma, the embarrassment. It all comes flooding up, and most people's immediate response is, shut that stuff off. Turn on the television. And our culture has mastered what Kierkegaard called tranquilization by the trivial to an extent unmatched in any culture in history. <laughs> But if we just keep turning attention inward, then the negativity emerges and can, can, in the light of awareness, can unfold 
and release and the ener free energy can become available. And, <coughs> and that is a wonderful, wonderful discovery. Then we discover these depths of the mind which are benevolent, beneficent, helpful, healing, etc. So it, it was such a relief in working with Jim to come to a trust in my own mind. And I think Jim did that in four ways. Point, first, he pointed out the distrust, all the ways I was distrusting the mind. Second, encouraged me to trust it. Third, he modeled trust of his, himself and his own mind. And the fourth, he encouraged me to read humanistic psychology with its much more generous view of the mind than the traditional psychoanalytic and behavioral views. And I really came to think of the mind as godlike, having this extraordinary self-organizing, self-healing, self-correcting, and self-transcending capacity. All we need to do is bring, bring attention to our mind, open to whatever experience emerges, and then healing will occur. And I've come to think there are two absolutely crucial principles that are, we have to know about the nature of the mind and negative, negative experience. One is, whatever you're unwilling to experience sticks around until you are willing to experience it. And second, whatever you're unwilling to experience runs your life. Now that's a very powerful combination. And as we heal and grow, and as I worked with Jim, there's gradually a sense of the recognition that actually I didn't have to be doing so much with my mind, that the mind was a lot smarter and wiser than this little ego was. And that simply if the mind, if experience was brought, if, if awareness was brought to experience, the mind would do whatever was necessary. And more and more it came to a recognition of not having to work on the mind, not having to do, it was more and more moving towards a non-doing, a more Taoistic perspective, just allowing experience to be and flow. Um, and with that comes the capacity for being here now. When you don't have to work on something or change something, then you can just be, and where you find yourself is here now. Uh, and that's a profoundly important capacity, the capacity to just allow things to be. And I have a, there's a wonderful quote in A Course in Miracles, which is a um, curiously named but profound Christian contemplative path, which says, uh, when peace comes at last to those who wrestle with temptation and fight against the giving in to sin, when the light comes at last into the mind given to contemplation, when the goal is finally achieved by anyone, it always comes with just one happy realization. I need to do nothing. Oh. Oh. So, there were all these gifts. There was also the gift, uh, energetic gifts. Of course, there was more positive emotion with less negativity, with uh, l less judgment, condemnation. There was a lot more positive emotion. There was an extraordinary release of energy in therapy with Jim. One, one, there was one day, one day I recognized that I was using fatigue as a way of avoiding intimacy and closeness. And to my amazement, from that day on, I just needed an hour's less sleep. And off, but after that, as soon as I was sleeping less, then these thoughts came up, but if you don't get enough sleep, you'll go crazy, you, you won't be able to function, you won't be able to do your job, all these beliefs. So I gradually worked with these beliefs, and to my amazement, over a period of a few months, my sleep needs da went down from dying if I didn't get eight hours to only needing four hours a night as a result of working with these beliefs. I mean, it was an extraordinary experience, and I happily lived for a decade or so just needing only four hours, and it gradually crept back up, but uh, now to about six. But just seeing the power of those beliefs around something as obvious and clear as sleep was a very powerful demonstration. 
Um, I came towards, with Jim's help, a kind of godlike view of human nature. And I thank you very much for that quote, Ray, because it's a beautiful expression of Jim's profound appreciation of our inner subjectivity and his appreciation that who we most deeply are ha has a godlike capacity to, we are so much more the creators than the victims of our experience. We're creators of our experience, our world, ourselves. And, and yet, and yet, there's always more. And that was one of being Jim's big themes. Keep going, there's always more. And he wrote in the dialogue we did, or he said in the dialogue 30 years later we did, you know, there seems to be a shimmer, this illusion that at some point I'll have it, I'll get it. But there's a central dynamic of endless reaching. In fact, reaching to my mind is the richness of life. Not getting, but reaching. And I resist judging the reaching by whether or not one gets it. There is always so much more. We can have intense experiences, profound experiences, but it isn't ever the final experience. Beautiful statement. And there's a wonderful story in, uh, in, uh, uh, of, in uh, one of the early Zen books <coughs> about Harada Roshi, who was working with this dying young girl who was having these mind-boggling enlightenments, which I would give my teeth to have any one of them, but she just kept having one after another, and finally she had this experience. She assumed this was it. There can't possibly be any more, anything more profound. And Harada Roshi wrote back to her, enlightenment is capable of endless enlargement. Uh, there is always more to surprise us. And the story I like, like that demonstrates this is of a, a rabbi in Russia around the turn, <coughs> last turn of the last century who uh, used to cross the village tabernacle and go to pray. And one morning as he was crossing the, tabernacle, uh, the village square, ran into the village Cossack who was in a lousy mood. And the Cossack said, hi, rabbi, where are you going? The rabbi said, don't know. I forgot to emphasize the, the central teaching of this rabbi was he he holding openness, don't know mine. So he said to the Cossack, don't know. And the rabbi, a Cossack said, what do you mean you don't know? Every morning for 20 plus years you've crossed the square, you've gone to pray in the tabernacle. He was so angry, he grabbed the rabbi and hauled him off to the village jail. And just as he was throwing him in the cell, the rabbi said, see, you just don't know. <laughs> <coughs> so there was one uh, gift the greatest of all that perhaps that Jim gave me. And that was he uh, introduced me to my wife, Frances. Or at least he arranged the introduction. He, as uh, towards the end of therapy, he arranged me to go to a conference at Menninger on the voluntary control of internal states in Topeka, Kansas of all places. And I, the day before I just finished my psychiatry board exams, I'd done nothing but study for six months. I climbed on a plane, flew out there overnight, immediately became depressed, <laughs> not surprisingly, and broke into this little hut on the end, in, edge, of the, edge of the conference center and tried to get my head together. And on the last day of the conference, I finally screwed up my courage and stood up and said something. And at the back of the room, this woman stood up and said, I totally disagree. <laughs> Who could resist? <laughs> so anyway, <coughs> so. From Jim, uh, Francis says, a good thing you work with Jim because we would never have made it otherwise. And uh, so Jim prepared me for Francis and <laughs> Francis has been continuing Jim's work for these, these three, last three decades. And if I, I think the advanced therapy is therapy with an intimate partner. As Francis once said, only one of us can afford to take you seriously in this relationship and it's not gonna be me. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, so, uh, so Jim gave many, many gifts. Um, obviously, he gave me gifts beyond measure. I should say that I thought at the time that being uh, getting a, a wife or a, a partner 
was uh, a sign of special love from the, from the father, i.e. Jim, but then I learned that uh, Brian Wateen was also introduced to his spouse, so I realized the spouse was part of the treatment package. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just fine with me. <laughs> um, so Jim gave me and so many others uh, gifts beyond measure. He touched and transformed my life in ways I'm still trying to understand. And he enabled me and all of us to, uh, in our own small ways, to transform others. And I think of the extraordinary ripple effect he's had. I think he's literally touched millions of lives. I don't think that's an exaggeration uh, through his writings and through his therapy. And, and a few years later, afterwards, I was giving a talk at a, some conference or other, and some woman rushed up to me after the talk and said, oh, it's so wonderful to hear a psychiatrist talking like this. I've never, almost, I've never heard a psychiatrist say these kind of things. How did this happen? Well, I said, well, I went into therapy with Jim Bugatol. She said, oh, you went into therapy with Jim too, me? <laughs> so I was like, we can recognize one another, it seems. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's a line, of course, in Miracles where, which says it's impossible to overestimate the worth of your brother. And I think that <clears throat> that's my experience in Jim. He, there's no way I can overestimate his influence and his gift to me and what he did. And the, the Basque shamans have a wonderful image of human beings as walking stars. And I, th I like to think of all of us who've been touched by Jim and his life as having become a little bit brighter walking stars and walking out into this world of darkness and suffering and doing our little part to shed some light and healing there. Uh, our world is in grave trouble. Uh, we have an extraordinary imbalance between our technological power and our inner, power, inner awareness and power. We've become nuclear giants and technological wizards while remaining eth ethical adolescents and wisdom dwarfs. And clearly we're in a race between consciousness and catastrophe. And the work which Jim did, the gifts he gave, the person he was, was such he was offering and cultivating in others the very qualities that we most need uh, to survive this time. And he enabled us to take our part in this extraordinary challenge of our time to make our contributions <laughs> to the world in whatever ways we can. So thank you, Jim, and thank you all who are carrying on his legacy. Yeah. Gratitude to Jim. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And please, uh, if you'd like to share anything. Jim's way of doing therapy is interrupting the sound. Yeah, beautiful. The dialogue between you and Jim, is that available? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in the Journal of Humanistic Psychology, I think. What year do you remember that? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please. Some of you know I'm burdened by a compulsion to write rhyming couplets. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if there's a cure for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I do is I inflict them on other people. So as you were talking, here's what I wrote. I turn to you. I keep on hoping I will find some way to make friends with my mind. But it eludes me, and instead, I find the gross garbage in my head. Is there a way to fix this mess? I've tried and tried, but must confess. Each day my problem just gets worse, and I'm burdened by a curse. I turn to you. Please rescue me so I can join humanity. <laughs> I recommend getting on Tom's mailing list for his poems. <laughs> uh, he, he creates a continuous flood of them. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of what you said, Roger, uh, reminded me of R.D. Lang. Ah. So especially the move, the attempt to break out of our trance-like existence and uh, fear of the mind, and he had a, a wonderful word for it, psychophobia. Oh, that's great. And he accused most of us professionals as being the leaders 
encyclophobia, you know, two of our ways of standardizing and distancing ourselves from patients, etc. That's a great concept or a great phrase. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's a great talk. Yeah. Please. That was um, really a, a heartfelt and thoughtfulness uh, that well digested is just really a blessing. So I want to thank you for that. And to observe that um, you are speaking to really an integrator. Uh, the, the way that you were weaving what you were doing with Jim with what you were doing with your in your spiritual uh, practice, it seems very integrative. And because um, it's so easy to get caught into our territory, being like an existentialist, for instance, versus a transpersonalist or something like this, or these interdisciplinary warfares that just distract us from the main point. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to applaud. You're not at all seem to be caught in the labeling. Mm. And at the end of his life, Jim wasn't. Uh, actually, not even yeah. at the end. Yeah. He stopped labeling himself as an existentialist in terms of his writing for decades. Yeah. He would respond when called to that uh, name. And I think um, this is important, this integrator. Yeah. Yeah, I think Ray spoke to that in his introduction about the fact that Jim was beyond these labels. wasn't wasn't going to buy into the labels, yeah. I think, and it's interesting. There's a <coughs> one of the fields uh, that I find most exciting in contemporary psychology is the is adult developmental psychology, which is now beginning to map out post-conventional stages and finding what Maslow said, uh, finding evidence for what Maslow suggested decades ago that what we it's quote Maslow what we call normality is actually a form of collective developmental arrest. And that there are these post-conventional stages above, uh, beyond the conventional, and one of the characteristics of, the, of some of those stages is a so-called construct awareness, the recognition that construct, instead of being locked into in constructs and looking at the world from them, we step back and are able to look at them and realize they're just labels, and that who we are is bigger than the label, life is bigger than the label, and the labels have their uses. But it's a very different view. It's it's not looking at the world through that, but able to look at it and use it more skillfully and effectively. I think that's what you're describing very nicely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. As Ken would say, it's all true but partial. All true but partial, yeah. Everything's true but partial. Well, and again, thank you very much for... Uh, No, I just want to thank you for having some. Well, I want to thank you, so. <laughs> well, thank you all, everyone who's made this possible. It's such so, it's been such a wonderfully rich experience for me going back into and reflecting on the, the priceless gift of Jim and his life and his effects on me and all of us. And uh, so, th <coughs> and it's wonderful to think of so many people effectively being touched by and carrying his qualities into the world. So thank you very much. Yeah. Uh.